Hey everyone, it's Susie. I'll be your reader for today. Happy spring. Um, it's so nice out, so I'm on my back patio today. Hope you are all well and healthy. Today we're going to be reading 2 Samuel 18 through 20, so feel free to turn with me there. And we will get started here in a second, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Oil for the Journey follows the Bible reading plan called Ignite the Truth from Bridges for Peace, if you want to check that out. All right, so um, Second Samuel 18 is really after David, King David, sinned with Bathsheba, and a lot of things start falling apart um, with his leadership since there. So um, this is David um, starting to trying to reclaim his his palace and his throne in Jerusalem, and um, here we go. David mustered the men who were with him and appointed over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. David sent out his troops, a third under the command of Joab, a third under Joab's brother Abishai, son of Zeruiah, and a third under Ittai, the Gittite. The king told the troops, I myself will surely march out with you. But the men said, you must not go out. If we are forced to flee, they won't care about us. Even if half of us die, they will kill. but you are worth 10,000 of us. It would be better now for you to give us some support, to give us support from the city. The king answered, I will do whatever seems best to you. So the king stood beside the gate while all his men marched out in units of hundreds and of thousands. The king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Etai, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There, Israel's troops were routed by David's men, and the casualties that day were great, 20,000 men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside, and the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule he was riding kept on going. When one of the men saw what had happened, he told Joab, I just saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. Joab said to the man who had told him this, What? You saw him? Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? Then I would have had to give you ten shekels of silver and a warrior's belt. But the man replied, Even if, if a thousand shekels were weighed out into my hands, I would not lay a hand on the king's son. In our hearing, the king commanded, in our hearing, the king commanded you and Abishai and Etai, protect the young man Absalom for my sake. And if I had put my life in jeopardy and nothing is hidden from the king, you would have kept your distance from me. Joab said, I'm not going to wait like this for you. So he took three javelins in his hand and plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. And 10 of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him and killed him. Then Joab sounded the trumpet, and the troops stopped pursuing Israel, for Joab halted them. They took Absalom, threw him into a big pit in the forest, and piled up a large heap of rocks over him. Meanwhile, all the Israelites fled to their homes. During his lifetime, Absalom had taken a pillar and erected it in the king's valley as a monument to himself, for he thought, I have no son to carry on the memory of my name. He named the pillar after himself, and it is called Absalom's monument to this day. Now Ahimaaz, son of Zadok, said, Let me run and take the news to the king that the Lord has vindicated him by delivering him from the hand of his enemies. You are not, to, you are not the one to take the news today, Joab told him. You may take the news another time, but you must not do so today because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to a Cushite, Go, tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed down before Joab and ran off. Ahimaaz, son of Zodak, again said to Joab, Come what may, please let me run behind the Cushite. But Joab replied, My son, why do you want to go? You don't have any news that will bring you a reward. He said, Come what may, I want to run. Joab said, Run. Then Ahimaaz ran by way of the plain and outran the Cushite. While David was sitting between the inner and outer gates, the watchman went up to the roof of the gateway by the wall. As he looked out, he saw a man running alone. The watchman called out to the king and reported it. The king said, if he is alone, he must have good news. And the runner came closer and closer. Then the watchman saw another runner and he called down to the gatekeeper. Look, another man running alone. 
The king said he must be bringing good news too. The watchman said, it seems to me that the first one runs like Ahima, son of Zadok. He's a good man, the king said. He comes with good news. Then Ahimaaz called out to the king, All is well. He bowed down before the king and his face to the ground and said, Praise be to the Lord your God. He has delivered up those who lifted their hands against my lord the king. The king asked, Is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimaaz answered, I saw great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant and me your servant, but I don't know what it was. The king said, Stand aside and wait here. So he stepped aside and stood there. Then the Cushite arrived and said, My lord the king, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all those, all who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? The king, Cushite replied, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. If only I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Joab was told, The king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. And for the whole army, the victory that day was turned into mourning because on that day, the troops heard it said, The king is grieving for his son. The men stole into the city that day as men steal in, who are ashamed when they flee from battle. The king covered his face and cried aloud, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab went into the house of the king and said, Today you have humiliated all your men, who have just saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and the lives of your wives and concubines. You love those who hate you and hate those who love you. You have made it clear today that the commanders and their men mean nothing to you. I see that you would be pleased if Absalom were alive today and all of us were dead. Now go out and encourage your men. I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man not a man will be left with you by nightfall. This will be worse for you than all the calamities that have come on you from your youth till now. So the king got up and took his seat in the gateway. When the men were told the king is sitting in the gateway, they all came before him. Meanwhile, the Israelites had fled to their homes. Throughout the tribes of Israel, all the people were arguing among themselves, saying, The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies. He is the one who rescued us from the hand of the Philistines. But now he has fled the country to escape from Absalom. And Absalom, whom we anointed to rule over us, has died in battle. So why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? King David sent this message to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests. Ask the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his palace? Since what is being said throughout Israel has reached the king of his quarters. You are my relatives, my own flesh and blood. So why would you be the last to bring back the king? And say to Amasa, you are, not my own, are you not my own flesh and blood? May God deal with me be it ever so severely if you are not the commander of my army for life in place of Joab. He won over the hearts of the men of Judah so that they were all of one mind. They sent word to the king, return you and all your men. Then the king returned and went as far as the Jordan. Now the men of Judah had come to Gilgal to go out and meet the king and bring him across the Jordan. Shimei, son of Gera, the Benjamite from Behurim, hurried down with the men of Judah to meet King David. With him were a thousand Benjamites, along with Ziba, the steward of Saul's household, and, along, and his fifteen sons and twenty servants. They rushed to the Jordan where the king, they crossed at the ford to take the king's household over and to do whatever he wished. When Shimei, son of Gera, crossed the Jordan, he fell prostrate before the king and said to him, May my lord not be hold me guilty. Do not remember how your servants did wrong on the day my lord the, the king left Jerusalem. May the king put it out of his mind. For I am your servant, for I your servant know that I have sinned. But today I have come here as the first from the tribes of Joseph to come down and meet my lord the king. Then Abishai, son of Jehoriah, said, Shouldn't Shimei be put to death for this? He cursed the Lord's appointing. David replied, What does this have to do with you, the sons of Zuriah? What right do you have to interfere? Should anyone be put to death in Israel today? Don't I know that today I'm king over Israel? So the king promised, so the king said to Shimei, You shall not die. And the king promised him an oath. Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, also went down to meet the king. He had not taken care of his feet or trimmed his mustache or washed his clothes from the day the king left until the day he returned safely. When he came from Jerusalem to meet the king, the king asked him, Why didn't you go with me, Mephibosheth? 
He said, Lord, my Lord, the king, since I, your servant, am lame, I said, I will have my donkey saddled and I will ride on it so I can go with the king. But Ziba, my son, my servant, betrayed me, and he has slandered your servant to my Lord, the king. The Lord, the king, is like an angel of God to so do whatever you wish. All my grandfather's descendants deserve nothing but death from the Lord, your king, but your but you gave your servant a place among those who eat at your table. So what right do I have to make any more appeal to the king? The king said to him, Why say more? I order you and Ziba to divide the land. Mephibosheth said to the king, Let him take everything now that my lord the king has returned home safely. Barzillai, the Gileadite, also came down from Rogalim to cross the Jordan with the king and to send him on his way from there. Now, Barzillai was very old, 80 years old, he had provided for the king during his stay in Mahanaim, Mahanaim, for he was a very wealthy man. The king said to Barzillai, Come over with me and stay with me in Jerusalem, and I will provide for you. But Barzillai answered the king, How many more years will I live that I should go up to Jerusalem with the king? I am now 80 years old. Can I tell the difference between what is enjoyable and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats and drinks? Can I still hear the voices of male and female singers? Why should your voice, why should your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? Your servant will cross the Jordan with the king for a short dis distance, but why should the king reward me in this way? Let your servant return that I may die in my own town near the tomb of my father and my mother. But here is your servant, Kimham. Let him cross over with my lord the king. Do for him whatever you wish. The king said, Kimham shall cross over with me, and I will do for him whatever you wish. And anything you desire from me, I will do for you. So all the people crossed the Jordan, and then the king crossed over. The king kissed Barzillai and bid him farewell, and Barzillai returned to his home. When the king crossed over to Gilgal, Kimham crossed over with him. All the troops of Judah and half the troops of Israel had taken the king over. Soon all the men of Israel were coming to the king and saying to him, Why did our brothers, the men of Judah, steal the king away and bring him and his household across the Jordan together with all his men? All the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, We did this because the king is closely related to us. Why are you angry about it? Have we eaten any of the king's provisions? Have we taken anything for ourselves? Then the men of Israel answered the men of Je Judah, We have ten shares in the king. So we have a greater claim on David than you have. Why then do you treat us with contempt? Weren't we the first to speak of, speak of bringing back our king? But the men of Judah pressed their claims even more forcefully than the men of Israel. Now a troublemaker named Sheba, son of Bikri of Benjamite, happened to be there. He sounded the trumpet and shouted, We have no share in David, no part in Jesse's son, every man to his tent, Israel. So all the men of Israel deserted David to follow Sheba, son of Bikri. But the men of Judah stayed by their king all the way from the Jordan to Jerusalem. When David returned to his palace in Jerusalem, he took the ten concubines he had left to take care of the palace and put them in a house under guard. He provided for them, but had no sexual relations with them. They were kept in confinement till the day of their death, living as widows. Then the king said to Amasa, Summon the men of Judah to come to me within three days and be here yourself. But when Amasa went to summon Judah, he took longer than the time the king had set for him. David said to Abishai, Now Sheba son of Bikri will do us more harm than Absalom did. Take your master's men and pursue him, or he will find fortified cities and escape from us. So Joab's men and the Carathites and Pelethites and all the mighty warriors went out under the command of Abishai. They marched out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, son of Bikri. While they were at the great rock in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Joab was wearing his military tunic and strapped over it at his waist was a belt with a dagger in its sheath. As he stepped forward, it dropped out of its sheath. Joab said to Amasa, how are you, my brother? Then Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. Amasa was not on his guard against this dagger in Joab's hand, and Joab plunged into his belly, and his intestines spilled out onto the ground. Without being stabbed again, Amasa died. Then Joab and his brother Abishai pursued Sheba, son of Bikri. One of the men's, one of Joab's men stood beside Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, let him follow Joab. Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the middle of the road, and the, man, and the man saw all the troops come to a halt there. When he realized that everyone who came up to Amasa stopped, he dragged him from the road into a field and threw a garment over him. After Amasa had been removed from the, ground, from the road, everyone went on with Joab to pursue Sheba, son of Bikri. 
Akiba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel, Beth, Makkah, and through the entire region of the Bigrites, who gathered together and followed him. All the troops with Joab came and besieged Sheba in Abel, Beth, Makkah. They built a siege ramp up to the city and it stood against the outer fortifications. While they were battering the wall to bring it down, a wise woman called from the city, listen, listen, tell Joab to come here so I can speak to him. He went toward her and she asked, are you Joab? I am, he answered. She said, listen to what your servant has to say. I'm listening, he said. She continued, long ago, they used to say, get your answer at Abel, and that settled it. We are the peaceful and faithful in Israel. You are trying to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why do you want to swallow up the Lord's inheritance? Far be it from me, Joab replied. Far be it from me to swallow up or destroy. That is not the case. A man named Sheba, son of Bigri from the hill country of Ephraim, has lifted up his hand against the king, King David. Against David. Hand over this one man, and I'll withdraw from the city. The woman said to Joab, His head will be thrown to you from the wall. Then the woman went to all the people with her wise advice, and they cut off the head of Sheba, son of Bigri, and threw it to Joab. So he sounded the trumpet, and his men just dispersed from the city, each returning to his home. And Joab went back to the king in Israel. Joab was over Israel's entire army. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was over the Carathites and Pelites. And Adoniram was in charge of forced labor. Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat son of Ahilud, was recorder. Sheba was secretary. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. And Ira, the Jerite, was David's priest. All right. That was 2 Samuel 18 through 20. Hope that was a blessing to you and hope you are all well. God bless you guys and we'll see you again soon. Take care.